looking at discrete time systems before. What we have not done is to look at discrete time systems in a transform domain. We have defined the Fourier transform, but entirely in a continuous time context. Today, we shall first begin by looking at the other options or realistic options available for interpolation or for reconstruction of a signal from its samples. And we shall also analyze the inaccuracies that result as a process of that realism or as a process of the fact that our method of reconstruction is not perfect. Subsequently, we shall move towards the development of the Fourier transform in a discrete time context. All right. So, let us begin then by looking carefully a little more in depth at the problem of reconstruction. Now, recall that we had defined the process of reconstruction by looking at the frequency domain. We said that if we were obeying the Nyquist criterion, then the interval of f s by 2 to plus f s by 2, where f s is the sampling frequency on the f or the frequency axis is what the signal occupies even after sampling. That was critical, right? Even after sampling, this is the frequency range that the signal occupies. And therefore, if we put a low pass filter with a cutoff of f s by 2, an ideal low pass filter, then we reconstruct the original signal perfectly. right? We also interpreted the process of putting an ideal low pass filter on the train of samples. The manner in which we proceeded was to find the impulse response of the low pass filter, which turned out to be a sine t by t kind of pattern, a sync pattern. And if the low pass filter had a cutoff of f s by 2, then the nulls or the zeros of that sync pattern lie exactly at the points of sampling other than the point which is being reconstructed. What I mean is, when you have a train of impulses, the effect of passing that train of impulses through this low pass filter is to take this sync pattern shifted by every multiple of the sampling interval, scale it by the samples and add these scaled and shifted versions of the sync pattern. Now, if the if the low pass filter has a cutoff of f s by 2, then the zeros of the sync pattern fall at the sampling points. So, that sync pattern which has been shifted to the sample, let us say sample number 3, will have nulls or zeros at all other sample numbers. So, therefore, at that particular sampling point, the sum of all these sync patterns is just the same as the value of the sample itself and therefore, it results in interpolation. Yeah. However, the sync pattern is not a realistic pattern. There is no circuit which can generate the sync pattern exactly. In fact, if you look at it carefully, the sync pattern thought of as an impulse response makes the system non-causal. Not only non-causal, there is something much worse. You see a system can be non-causal and yet with some modification realizable in the following sense. When is a system non-causal? If its impulse response is non-zero for t less than 0. Now, of course, the sync pattern is non-zero for many, many points t less than 0. But again, if there is a finite negative value of t, let us say t equal to minus t naught, up to which the impulse response could possibly be non-zero, but beyond which, beyond means for t less than minus t 0, if you are sure that the impulse response is going to be 0, even so, one can think of a realization in the following sense. 
one could delay that whole impulse response by T0. And in that case, the only effect on the frequency response is to add a linear phase. We have discussed this before. The process of delay adds a linear phase. Now, adding the linear phase has no effect on the magnitude. In fact, the other way of looking at it is that the delay is itself a time invariant and linear system. So, if you have a delay followed by the ideal low pass filter, it is equivalent to the output of the ideal low pass filter being delayed. So, the only consequence is that we would delay the output, delay by a finite time. But that is not a serious problem, if that were the case, right. If it were true that the impulse response was non-zero for negative t only up to a finite negative value, then we would not have had such a problem or there would not have been such an objection to this impulse response. But unfortunately, that is not the case. The problem is that the impulse response is non-zero for negative t right up to infinity. And no matter how much we delay, we shall never be able to bring the impulse response completely on the positive side of the t axis. That is the problem. So, non-causality by itself is a problem, but that is not really the most serious problem. The most serious problem is no matter what finite delay you give the system, it can never be made causal. There are other reasons why this impulse response poses problems. It is a little beyond our scope to discuss all the details at this point in time, but let me just mention the points in informal language. Of course, the point that I just stated that is no amount of finite delay can make it causal is an important point. But an additional point is that such a system cannot be realized by what is called a rational system or a rational transfer function. You, may, you are not entirely unfamiliar with rational transfer functions. You have probably been exposed to a course on networks and there you have calculated transfer functions of networks. Now, one thing you notice about transfer functions of networks is that they are a ratio of polynomials in S. Unfortunately, a response of this kind can never be realized as a finite ratio of polynomials in S. That is what we mean when we say the system is not rationally realizable. That is a serious problem as far as realization goes as well, right. So, this is a background as to why there is such a strong objection to realizing or why there is such a strong difficulty or an obstacle in realizing the ideal interpolator. This is called the ideal interpolator. This is often the case with issues in signals and systems or in signal processing. We know what ideal we work towards, but we also can show the ideal is unrealizable. A lot of situations in electrical engineering including the design of filters, which is actually related to this, suffer from this malaise, right. We know what ideal we are striving towards. We also know why that ideal is not achievable. But perhaps the boon is that we also know from there what we can do to get as close to the ideal as we wish. And we also know what we can do to trade off resources or trade off investment versus benefit in some sense, right. So, here also we shall look for a trade off between investment and benefit. What is the investment? The investment is we shall try and allow more and more complexity. So, we will start with a very simple version of an interpolator. And we will show how we can make it more complex and still realize the process of uh, reconstruction. So, let us begin then with a train of samples obtained by sampling an analog signal. So, we have a signal on continuous time. We assume the signal is band limited. And we assume that we are sampling the signal with an adequate sampling rate to take, to take care of the Nyquist criteria. So, the sampling rate is greater than, well greater than twice the maximum frequency component present in the signal. So, we have these samples. 
the ideal interpolator would put a sync pattern at each of these sample locations and scale the sync pattern by the strength of the impulse and add the sync patterns. We can't do that. So, what is the simplest thing that we can do in lieu of it? Well, the simplest thing is to sample and hold. That means, instead of allowing the sample to drop suddenly to 0, we can hold it until the next sample value comes. So, we make a piecewise constant approximation to the sigma. And we call this a sample and hold. What do we mean by sample and hold? We mean that after this sample is taken, for example, we retain the value until the next sample arrives. And then again, when the next sample arrives, we retain the value until the next comes, and so on and so forth. So, we get a signal like this. And you may visualize it is being continued. So, this is called a sampled and held signal. The word hold of course is suggestive, it really means that you keep the sample value until the next sample comes. Now of course you will agree with me that the resultant signal has a lot of defects. The first among them being that it is going to be discontinuous at every sampling instant. And so we expect that you know if we interpret what we are doing from a frequency perspective, we are likely to see that the spectrum spreads all over the frequency axis. But on the other hand, we will also probably find that things are not as bad as they seem, right? In the sense that although the spectrum might spread all over the frequency axis, the effect of doing this in, in, in contrast with what we should have done ideally might be actually to, dis, to, to do two things. One is to distort the original spectrum in a certain way and the second is not to cancel all the other aliased replicas. Two things will happen, right? One is that the original spectrum is going to get distorted in some way as a process of this reconstruction and the second is that the other aliased spectra or the other replicas of the original spectrum that arise at every multiple of the sampling frequency do not all get quite cancelled. So, we shall now interpret this operation of sample and hold in the frequency domain. And before we do that, we must justify why we are looking at this operation so carefully. Well, this operation is implementable by a very simple circuit and therefore is practically realizable. Right? All that we need to do to implement this operation is to use an operational amplifier with some capacitors and resistors and field effect transistors if you wish. The idea is this, I mean one can, I leave it to you to complete the details of the circuit, but I shall give you an idea of what we want to do. You see, if you have an operational amplifier, I presume that a lot of you would have been exposed to operational amplifiers, you have been using operational amplifiers and you have some idea how they work. Yeah. So, if we use an operational amplifier, And we use a capacitor here and a field effect transistor here as also here. 
Now, as I said, I am giving the scheme. The circuit might need to be refined, but the scheme is this. You see, we have a gating pulse that controls this circuit, gating pattern. The role of the gating pattern is the following. Just for a little while, we turn at the beginning of the sampling instant, we turn on, you know, this field effect transistor, right? And at that point, this signal is simply transmitted to this capacitor, alright? And the capacitor charges to the signal value. Subsequently, we cut off this field effect transistor and we also cut off this transistor. So, the output that is seen at this point is the charge is the voltage across the capacitor which is equal to the sample value at that point. Now, at the end of the sampling interval, one can again use a proper control on the gating pulses to recharge the capacitor, right? And then again cut off the input signal from the capacitor so that it holds. So, you see this capacitor is acting as the hold here and the field effect transistor acts as the cut off and join point between the input signal and the output capacitor. The operation, you might wonder why I am using an operational amplifier, it is just you know it, it, it just allows you a little bit of control. You know see what I have described as I said is the broad principle of working of the circuit. As I said, the circuit would require corrections. My intention here is not to go into the entire analog behavior of the circuit, but just to give a scheme, right? Just to give a feel of how a sample and hold circuit can be built. Actually, when you build a sample and hold circuit, you would have to refine this considerably, right? It would not work so crudely because typically an input signal cannot be loaded like this. So, the operational amplifier needs to you, you know, the, in fact the operational amplifier allows you to use some protection and so on. So, the idea here is really that, you know, one can, in fact, what one can do is instead of giving it here, one can, you know, give the input signal here. So, there is a flex, I am sorry, actually this, there, there should have been a correction, I am sorry. The input signal should have been given here and this should have been a follower, I am sorry. Please make that correction. There is a, you see the input signal should be given here, that is the reason why the operational amplifier is used, right. The, uh, so now what happens is, if this is cut off, then this is just held at this point, but it is not transmitted to the output. I am sorry, so that means, so as I said, you know, uh, I had drawn that part wrongly, but the point here is, you know, let us not get into the details of the non-idealities of the op amp and so on, but the operational amplifier is used here to allow for a buffer between the input signal and the you know sudden charging and discharging that occurs across the capacitor. So, please make this little correction, the small correction that needs to be made in the circuit. Anyway, the point is, I mean from my intention in this course is not to go into the analog aspect of the circuit, but to bring out the fact that one can use a very simple circuit based on operational amplifiers, capacitors, field effect transistors to realize a sample and hold operation, right, with this little correction. And therefore, it is worthwhile if we have a very simple circuit that can an operation like this, it is worthwhile to see how badly that operation does in the frequency domain, right. If here we are, so here we are at one end of the trade off, a very simple circuit to achieve what we want to, but perhaps a pretty bad, you know, behavior in the frequency domain. So, what are we doing in the frequency domain? We need to understand this, right. What are we doing? Actually, it is very simple. If you think about it, all that we are doing in this process of sample and hold, would you like to, would you like to comment on what we are doing here? Can we interpret this, can we interpret this sample and hold operation from the perspective of system behavior? Can we think of this as passing that, that impulse train through some linear shift invariant system? And if so, what is the impulse response of that linear shift invariant system? Do you understand my question? Can we think, you see, if we can do that, if we can think of this sample and hold operation as passing the sampled signal, the ideally sampled signal through a linear and shift invariant system, 
then we can interpret this process in the frequency domain very easily. Just as the ideal reconstruction process could be thought as passing the sample train through an ideal low pass filter that is a linear shift invariant system. So, similarly what is the linear shift invariant system that we are passing the sample train through in this case that is the question that I am posing. So, would, you, would someone like to answer it would be nice if yeah all right yes Nikhil just a moment I think you should give a proper detailed reply. So, so you know what we are saying is how do we interpret yes, yes. So, in between the samples the frequency must be 0 and just at the point of sample it will shoot up to infinity. It will be very much. Uh, well, you see my question is I am I'm, I'm not I am not really interested in what will happen at individual time points. My question is how can I interpret this operation? as an equivalent operation where I am passing that ideal sample train through a linear shift invariant system. So, if so can I interpret it that way? If so, if so then um, what is that linear shift invariant system right can you tell me the impulse response of that linear shift invariant system. So, uh, you are given the sample train right? That is right. So, after that uh, you need a system whose impulse response is just a pulse. That is correct, that is correct. So, Ameya has the right answer. See, he says that you can interpret this process of sample and hold as passing the sample train. That is right, that is the right answer. The ideal sample train through a linear shift invariant system. whose impulse response is just a pulse and the output here is a sample and held signal. Yeah. Can you see that? Well, visualize. Now, now visualize what will happen when you pass. I mean, to, to understand that what Amaya say, is saying is correct. Visualize the effect of passing this sample train. So, let me do the following. Let me, you know, let me remove this held part now. And now, let's visualize passing the sample train through this linear shift invariant system. Alright, what will happen? Well, as before, this impulse response will be shifted to each sample location. I mean, what, what is the effect of putting an impulse as an input into a linear shift invariant system? It simply gives the impulse response. If the impulse is at 0, it gives the impulse response as it is. If the impulse is at some other point T0, it would shift the impulse response to T0. Further, if the impulse has a strength of C, the impulse response will be scaled by C. So, what is the effect of passing the sample train through a linear shift invariant system with this impulse response? It is to take this impulse response, translate it so that the 0 point comes at each of these sample locations and to scale this pulse by the sample strength, the strength of the impulse. And you can visualize that is exactly what the sampled and held signal is. Is that right? So, therefore, the sampled and held signal is just a result of passing the sample train through a non-ideal reconstruction filter. You can think of this as a filter. Why can you think of it as a filter? It is a linear shift invariant system. It is stable. Why is it stable? Because the impulse response is finite, is absolutely integrable. 
In fact, you can calculate the absolute integral of the impulse response. What is the absolute integral of the impulse response? 1 multiplied by Ts. So, of course, it is absolutely integrable. If a system, if a linear shift invariant system has an absolutely integrable impulse response, then it also has a frequency response. And we can find out the frequency response by taking the Fourier transform of the impulse response. Let us find out the frequency response. This Ts, of course, needless to say, is the sampling interval here. So, let us find out the frequency response. It is very easy. What do we expect? In fact, we can also predict what the frequency response will be like. We have encountered this kind of a pattern before. The Fourier transform of pulse is a sin f pi f kind of pattern. right? So, let us find out the Fourier transform. So, it is very easy. It is just 0 to Ts e raised to the power minus j 2 pi f t dt. This is, this is the frequency response capital H of f of the system. So, this is very easy to evaluate. It is simply 1 minus e raised to the power minus j 2 pi f t s divided by j 2 pi f, I am sorry, yeah, j 2 pi f. Is that correct? And I can rewrite this in a convenient way. can rewrite this as e raised to the power minus j pi f t s pi I am sorry not f s I am sorry this, this is not f s it is just f 2 j sin pi f t s divided by 2 j pi f and I shall multiply and divide by T s for convenience. Please check if my expression is correct and of course, please rectify the F s here. It is not F s, but F. That is right. T s here is the sampling interval. T s is the sampling interval. The question was whether T s is the same as the sample period. Yes, indeed. T s is the sample period. Sir, yes. Sir, the analysis we did earlier with TP and TS. Yeah. Why is it not the special case of TP equal to TS? Ah. You see, the question is why is the analysis that we carried out earlier, right, where we simply gated the signal? for a TP less than TS, the same as what we are doing here, right? Why do not we treat, you know, why do not we treat this as a limiting case of that with TP equal to TS? Now, there is a fundamental difference between that process and this process. In that process, we are not really sampling. We are allowing the signal to go through. So, we are multiplying by a train of pulses. That is a very good question. This is a common you know, this is a common confusion that often results in the mind of a student. What we discussed in the very beginning of our, dis of our uh, you know, introduction to sampling was the process of natural sampling, where we gated the signal. We allowed the signal to go through for a certain interval and then we stopped it. And we allowed uh, it to go through again and stopped it. But that is not the same as sampling the signal ideally and then holding it. They are two different things. That is because in sampling the signal, ideally we are taking only the signal value at the sampling instant. We are ignoring the sample value afterwards. In the, we are ignoring the signal values afterwards. And you see, and, and what Amaya says is, you see, in fact, if you happen to hold, I mean, what you could do as a modification to this technique or a, as a modification to the sample and hold procedure is that if you have an ideal sample train here, instead of holding it right up to the next sample, you could choose if you wish to hold it for a certain sub interval 
of T s. You could do that if you wish. But that is not the same as gating the signal for an interval of for this interval. It is not the same as gating the signal for this interval and then you know releasing the signal for this interval. You are not gating it, you are taking the sample value and holding it. So, they are two different things. In fact, the process of natural sampling is not a linear shift invariant operation. The process of natural sampling is not a linear shift invariant operation, it is a linear operation but not shift invariant. It is very easy to see that. If I shift the signal by a certain amount, the gated parts of the signal will change and therefore they are not equal to the original output shifted by the same amount. So, the process of natural sampling cannot be thought of as a linear shift invariant operation. Yeah? In fact, sampling itself is a linear operation but not shift invariant. Right? So, we conclude the lecture here today and proceed in the next lecture where we take up further this question of interpolation and then we proceed to a discussion of the Fourier transform is applied to discrete sequences. Thank you. So, here can we do the sample? Yeah. So, here can we do the sample? The whole while we are doing the gating itself? Uh, you mean hold it after natural? While yeah, you can do. So, you can have a combination of natural sampling and sample and hold and hold. So, yeah, you can, you can hold.